Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to NCC. We want to welcome those watching online. Also, let's welcome our first-time guests, those that are visiting here. If you're here for the first time, we welcome you to New Community Church. And y'all, you kind of already feel like a first-time guest. You probably haven't been here for a while. Those of you that haven't attended the last couple weeks uh, know that we've been in this series, uh, The Church Define. But if you're here for the first time, that's, uh, that's, we're welcoming you into that series our third Sunday in. We're going to finish it up next week. And of course, you can't exhaust the subject of the church in four Sundays, but we're going to try to do so. Today's going to be a great day. I'm so thankful for last Sunday. Jeremy rocked it last Sunday, brought the heat. And uh, thank you, Jeremy. Heard such good reports. And uh, the sermon just meant a lot to a lot of people. And today, I really believe that God wants to speak to his church as it relates to the birth of the church, how the birth of the church inverted Babel. Okay, so we're going to look into that. We're going to dive into God's word. And, and I believe it's going to be applicable to our everyday lives. So let's pray. Father, thank you for today, for the opportunity to sing, to worship, to study, to just hang out. I pray, God, uh, those that are watching online would also feel that connectivity in the spirit as we break the bread of life together and we study your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen. I had a friend, he's a business owner in Indiana, one of the racquetball guys I used to play racquetball with, called me this week, and he said, Simeon, what's going on? And uh, like, are we living in the last days? I mean, are we, where do you think we are in Scripture? How can we apply what's going on? How can we see in God's Word? And just, he started firing these questions at me, and I said, and I agree with you, I do think that we are living in unprecedented times. Never in my lifetime have we ever canceled church for over two months and school's been canceled and no basketball, no football. I mean, something's wrong, right? Come on, can I get an amen on that? Something's not right. China, they're rioting in China and protesting because of the Hong Kong situation. Um, then you have the COVID virus. It just seems to uh, cause things to even escalate even more. Because of the quarantine, social distancing, wearing masks, not being able to see someone's facial expressions, um, everyone hunkering down, waiting on permission to go out in the public and to live like we normally would. And in the middle of all this, we have some racial uh, unrest and police brutality and someone that gets killed right on the street and people are watching this and and it's affecting us at, 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 at so many different ways. And like, what is going on? What's, what's with the injustice? What's with all of the evil? And then you've got, you know, corrupt politicians and corrupt religious leaders. And then people are wondering, who, who are we, who, do, who can we trust? What, what, what's the answer? And as a pastor, as a leader, and I've talk, I'm talking to a lot of pastors and leaders around the country, and we're all feeling the same thing. I, I'm at a place now where I have no words. I, I have no words, but I do have the word. And I don't have answers, but I do have the answer. And so in today's session, as we study the birth of the church, how it inverts or how it inverted Babel, I, I think it will give us some insight. Of course, like I said, we can't exhaust this subject. So you just have to go with me. We're going to be here for a few minutes, and first service really went well, and I felt like the Holy Spirit helped me articulate truths that needed to be articulated so that everyone in the room could understand, because we're a dynamic audience. The Word of God is, is so multifaceted. How it works is supernatural, so I pray that God's Word would do its work today. But, but we, we see the problems in our world, and we say, what's the cause of it? We point to different groups and say, you're the, you're the reason. You know, the Republicans are the reason and the Democrats and everyone. It, okay, so we can go political on this, but it's not a political problem. It's a spiritual problem. Man's kingdom is broken. The kingdom of man is broken. We're not doing a good job governing ourselves. The Bible teaches that in the last days, that ethnic group will rise up against ethnic group. Nation will rise against nation. The Bible tells us that this is going to happen. There's going to be racial tension, and there has been racial tension. There's been a human being that just died the other day in the streets. And, 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 and we say, okay, this police did this, but I know a lot of good polices. 
I know a, I know a lot of good police officers. I, I so is it is it who who who, who how. How can we blame? Who can we blame? The scripture talks about how the enemy is really controlling the world behind the scenes. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. So racism in the world is not new. It's, it's not just in America. It's worldwide, and it's as old as the devil himself. Lucifer, that fallen angel, is the author of confusion. He's the author of disunity. He's the father of lies and deception. And until we get, until we uh, come to terms with this and get a grip on this, we'll misunderstand most of what's happening around us. Man's kingdom is broken. And so the, the kingdom of, of, of this world, the problem with our self-governing, is only going to get worse and worse until Christ returns. And when Christ returns, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. So there are mysteries in the scripture, mysteries in the word of God, that many theologians and pastors debate on. I, set, I definitely don't want to introduce any debate today. I want to talk about two mysteries that can truly help us. We can see the revealed truth in these mysteries. God's kingdom versus Satan's kingdom, or God's kingdom versus man's kingdom. You've got to study ecclesiology and eschatology. Ecclesiolo ecclesiology is the study of the church, or the theolo theology of the church. Eschatology is the theology of the future of mankind. And there's so many differing opinions on what's going to happen in the end time, what's going to happen in the last days. And so today we're going to discuss two important mysteries that help us unpack some things and maybe give us insight. The first one is Mystery Babylon reveals man's kingdom. That's oversimplified. It's, it's deeper than just saying man's kingdom. Satan is really the controlling force behind the scene. Jesus said that Satan is the prince of this world or the ruler of this world. He's the power behind the power. And when you look at Mystery Babylon, I think it can either scare you or think, oh, well, then I don't want to study that. I don't want to look at the book of Revelation. I remember growing up, and when a pastor would start reading from Revelation, I would like, I don't want to be in the building. This scares me. Y'all, you don't have to be afraid of Revelation. The Bible says that, 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 that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of Revelation. So the, the entire book of Revelation is really pointing to Christ and his reign, God's rule that will ultimately trump Satan's rule. And so, Mystery Babylon is connected to Ancient Babylon. Ancient Babylon, the Babylonians were ruling the world for quite some time. And it was a demonic culture, a culture of, of human trafficking, and ultimately dead set on the deception and the destruction of the people of God. We see this in Ancient Babylon. And, and of course, the beast that this mystery Babylon rides on or the vehicle or the mode of operation is a, is a world system or a government system that is anti-Christ. So let's just go ahead and read it from Revelation 17. You got, you got to pay attention to this. I'm reading from the King James. It says, John is saying, he carried me or the spirit carried me into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names and blasphemy, having, having seven heads and ten horns and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon. So this wasn't just a bad dream John was having because he had tacos the night before. This, was a, this is metaphorical, it's symbolic, but Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So what is this? When you read that, I can see why, well, then I don't want to read that again. That's, that's, that's a nightmare. The spirit behind Mystery Babylon, according to many theologians, is, is one of deception. And not just for our age, but since the beginning of man, there's been a spirit of deception. Jesus even said that the, the Antichrist was, that spirit of Antichrist, is, it was in the earth back then. Arrogance, self-indulgence, self-rule, deception, brutality towards the people of God. 
towards God's glory, to defame God and to defame his glory. It's, it's really symbolic of a, of a political, a corrupt political and a, and a corrupt religious system, man-made, man-made religion. These are two strange bedfellows. They work well together as Satan uses it. So check this out in chapter 18 and verse 2. It's describing the essence of, the mis- of mystery Babylon. This is pretty graphic. The habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. So the importance of God's people or believers not getting caught up or deceived by a system, a man-made system that was never intended to ultimately rule. It's a corrupt system, and there's no way we're going to dive into all of the things that are going on behind the scenes, things that would really shock you. I couldn't say in a public room. that it, Things are not getting better. Even though we are seemingly evolving into high-tech society, there is a darkness that's darker than, than the blackest night you could ever see that's behind the scenes. More, de- more demonic than you would ever imagine. Look what it says in Revelation 18, 23. Speaking to Mystery Babylon, the Lord is speaking to Mystery Babylon and says, for by thy sorceries, everyone say sorceries. So there, there is a deception like none other. For by thy sorceries were all the nations deceived. Were all the nations deceived. And, and, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So it's, it's bigger than COVID. It's more than just a million plus people getting COVID or dying from it. More than 100,000 in the United States. If, y'all, this, this, if you, I think the naivety, it, it, it's, this is never in the history of the world have we experienced this. So we have to pay attention. We, what's going on? We've got to be able to talk to our kids and our families about it. What's happening though is that nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to go to the Word and say, how can we find ourselves in the pages of Scripture? Even though there might be disagreement, it's good to talk. To understand the, the, the spirit behind mystery Babylon, you have to go to ancient Babylon. Ancient Babylon, they ruled the, the world for about 430 years. Very wicked, very bloodthirsty. They worshipped Molech. Uh, they sacrificed children to their gods. It was awful. It was bad. And they were, they were slave traffickers. They took slaves from countries and they would make them build their societies. This was Babylon, actual ancient Babylon. In Revelation, it's speaking of mystery Babylon. So there's a, there's a Babylon, there, there's something that's dark that's been here for quite a while. But to look at ancient Babylon, you have to go even before that to Babel. Everyone say Babel. Babel. Babel was this tower or this city that was built by a guy named Nimrod. Nimrod was a very wicked character he was the great he was the great grandson of Noah and the Bible calls him a mighty one in the earth the Bible calls Nimrod a, a mighty hunter he wasn't hunting deer or animals he was hunting people he was a people hunter he would go and hunt down people take them as slaves and he would build his culture by using this force and he was a he was a vile wicked man he he was controlled by by Satan And the the, the scripture talks about Nimrod and speaks of Nimrod as one that God wasn't happy with, God wasn't pleased with. He was the first world leader after the flood, starting this first fascist one world government that God was upset with. The earth was of one language. There, There was only one language on the earth at that time. Everybody spoke the same language. It's important for you to know this. So look, let's go to Genesis 11. And y'all hang with me. I'm not going to be real long today, but check this out. In in verse 1 of Genesis 11, it says this. The whole earth, this this was the time that Nimrod was ruling. The whole earth had one language and the same words. And as the people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. 
And they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. So it's very humanistic. Lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have all one language and this is only the beginning of what they will do. In other words, with this unity, they had power to do great evil, right? So there's no limit, right? Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel. Everyone say Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So when you think of all the languages, 6,000 plus languages on earth, it all goes back to this, this moment. So this is significant. The world is all dispersed, and there are different people groups, different languages. There's, people have been scattered. There may be someone in this room that's bilingual. You know two languages. Maybe, maybe you know three or four. That's great. There are 6,000 languages. So how does that have anything to do with the church? Where's the connection here? The reason there are so many languages goes back to this Tower of Babel, this original one world government that God was shutting down because the evil Nimrod was running things. And so God introduced confusion, the confusion of diverse languages to stop this unholy unity. It was unity, but it was unholy unity for, for the work of Satan to be done in the earth. A one world system. Now, I want to bring in some good news right now. Y'all say, yeah, about time. So here's the good news. Let's talk about Christ and his church. The mystery of Christ through the church reveals the coming kingdom of God. This is the good news that we need to land on. This is the filter by which we should filter everything. That the mystery of Christ through the church is good news. Think of the church like this. The church is like an outpost in a, in, a, in, a, in a no man's land or a wilderness area. Or maybe th this would help you understand it better. The church is like an embassy on foreign soil where there's darkness and, and corruption. If you know, if you've watched movies, if you've seen anything about embassies around the world, like if the United States has an embassy on foreign soil, that square footage, that property is sovereign. It, the United States owns that. And if you're a U.S. citizen and you're, you're coming up against uh, a threat or you're running for your life, you will seek refuge, you will seek sanctuary in the U.S. Embassy in order to be safe. The church is like that. The scripture says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous that runneth into it are safe. So when we gather in his name, when we come as believers, and as we worship and as we study scripture together, it is a sanctuary. That's why churches, they call their auditorium sanctuary. It's, it, this is a sanctuary. This is a place where we gather. This is a place where that, that we are representing the kingdom of God. The church represents the coming kingdom of God. And Satan does not like that because it's tearing down his kingdom ultimately. That's why we celebrate the church. That's why we need to gather as much as we can. That's why watching it on video for long periods of time is not going to be good enough. I get it. We did it for a season, but we've got to come together. Satan knows that if he can disrupt the church, he's going to get a foothold even stronger in the world. So the mystery of Christ is not necessarily seen just through individuals in isolation, although that can happen from time to time, but it's primarily through the spiritual gatherings and connectivity of God's people. Let's look at Ephesians 3.20. Check this out. I love this. Verse 2. Paul is saying, Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery, everyone say mystery, how, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written br briefly, when you read this, 
you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. There that word is again, the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery, and he gives some insight to it, this mystery is that the Gentiles, that's ordinary people like you and I, that's people of all uh, races, they're included, they're fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So we see a little indicator of what, of what this mystery of, of Christ is really all about. It's about inclusion, right? It's about bringing people in, people that are outsiders. You know, we were all strangers from the commonwealth of Israel. We were alienated from God's promise, but now in Christ Jesus, we who are far off are made are brought in because of the blood of Christ. This is what Paul's talking about here. He's, he's, he said that in another place, but there's a connection here. Look at verse 8, Ephesians 3, 8. To me, though I'm at the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. To preach to the Gentiles, whew, right? The unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan. Everyone say the plan. What is the plan of the mystery? hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church, so the, the word so is there, there's a connection, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, uh, many of you who work on cars know what a manifold is, that's not talking about, it's not a car, an engine, manifold, it's, the, it's so diverse, it's so dynamic, the, the wisdom of God is inexhaustible, so the, the church reveals this manifold wisdom of God and it's made known to the rulers and the authority in where? The heavenly places. So all of the heavenly hosts, all of the fallen angels, all of the demons see God's plan through the church. Every time Satan sees the church, he's reminded of who's going to ultimately reign because we represent the kingdom of God on earth now. And this was according to the eternal purpose which was realized that he had realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness, I like that word boldness, and access with confidence through faith in him. So this is exciting news. This is good stuff. How God is using the church to reveal his wisdom to the principalities and the powers, the, the dark rulers of this world, to the angelic realm, to the, to the hidden world. With the church is, is, is a representation of God's authority and God's rule. So the mystery of Christ revealed through the church is a reminder of God's plan. God's plan that he's going to rule the world again. So here's what I want to wrap up with. What about the church? When, when did the church start? When was the birth of the church? Because we're talking about how the birth of the church inverted Babel. On the day of Pentecost. Everyone say Pentecost. Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. Did you know that today is Pentecost Sunday? If you look at your calendar, today is Pentecost Sunday. Now, I have to qualify. I was raised as a Pentecostal. My dad was a Pentecostal preacher. My grandfather, all my uncles, Pentecostal preachers. I grew up not really liking the name Pentecostal because it always came, there was always like a, something stuck to it. Like, okay, so you guys are the weird people that worship weird and all this stuff. No, I have a, a renewed appreciation for what this really this word Pentecost really means it's a Jewish holiday a Jewish feast day I should say and the word Pentecost means 50 I remember asking some of my Pentecostal friends do you know what the name of our denomination means Pentecost on the day of Pentecost well it means 50 why does it mean 50 it's referring to this Jewish festival, this Jewish feast day called the Feast of Weeks or Seven Weeks or more particularly 50 days. Well, if you go back to the history of God's people in Egyptian bondage, they were enslaved by the Egyptians. God sets them free when they kill this Passover lamb, which was symbolic of Christ, put the blood on the doorpost. They escape Egyptian bondage. They cross the Red Sea. They get into the wilderness. They're at Mount Sinai. And God starts speaking to the children of Israel. The Bible says that the, this is the first time this has ever happened. The thunderings of the voice of God. I've been reading on this. And there are many Jewish scribes, rabbis, theologians 
that say that these thunderings represent the voice of God, that it was 70 languages coming all at once to the people of God. And it overwhelmed them. They didn't want to hear the voice of God. They wanted to just hear through Moses. And it was like a, a precursor of what, would, of what would come because that, that was Pentecost in the Old Testament. That was 50 days after they escaped Egyptian bondage. 50 days after Passover lamb was killed. Now you flash forward into the New Testament. Jesus came. He lived a sinless life, walked this earth, did miracles. He died on the cross, was buried in a borrowed tomb, rose again on the third day, told his followers to go and gather in until they would be endued with power from on high. So 10 days after his ascension, they gather in a room. And they're there for several days praying and just waiting on God. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, and I have a renewed appreciation for what happened here. It's awesome. In verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the death of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection, he is the Passover lamb. So 50 days after, on the day of Pentecost, they were all together and in one place. And suddenly there came a, from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them, each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling, this is verse 5, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Keep that in mind. Remember all the languages that were scattered at the Tower of Babel way back in the Old Testament? All, all the people groups in that part of the world gathered on, on the day of Pentecost there for a reason. Because God's getting ready to do something amazing. And at the sound of the multitude, they came together. And they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, astonished saying, are not... All these who are speaking Galileans. Or in other words, how do these simple Galileans know these complex languages? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? And then it lists the, all of them. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Pergia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling our own tongues the mighty works of God. And they were all amazed and perplexed. What does this mean? This was not crazy church. This was, this, on this day of Pentecost, languages were being spoken. Yes, it was supernatural, but God was using ordinary, plain on ordinary human beings to speak languages that people could understand. It wasn't garbly gook. It was real languages. It was the language of love. God was telling these visitors, these foreigners from all walks of life, that the church is being born. It's significant. They're hearing about God. They're hearing good news in their own language. That's what God is doing in His church, that we speak that language. But, well, we're all English speaking. Well, what will God do supernaturally? I'm not saying that God cannot give you a prayer language in your private prayer closet that's wonderful but when we come together the language that God will speak through us is a language of love a language of inclusion like I, I posted something about what happened in Minneapolis because I'm outraged a human being died that, that upset me but then I thought the Holy Spirit said well you need to talk to some people you need to speak and so I started calling around the country some people that I know that are not like me and say, talk to me. How are you feeling? You're hurt by this. I want to hear it. What can I do as a pastor? Can I pray for you? I called one of my, uh, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a coach in at the college in, uh, in Phoenix. I said, man, how are you doing? He said, man, I'm doing good. This is rough. Or, he said, and, and, and he said, you won't believe, you know, how awesome it is for people to just say, I love you. It's so simple. That's how we change the world. That's how the church changes the world. I, I, I think we can vote right. I think we can protest when we need to protest. But that's not going to change the world. What's going to change the world is love. God's love. We are emissaries. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And when we tell others about Jesus and that he's coming to reign, that we, we show kingdom work by how we 
how we accept one another, how, how we get out of our bubbles, how we get out of our, you know, maybe you need to make some friends with people that are not exactly like you. It's so easy for us to just even have a connect group with people just like us. That's cool, fine. But find some other people that are not like you because people that are not like you can speak into your life and show you a different side in how things are in their world. I think our name, New Community Church, that's a great name. But I think it takes, in order to have unity, we need to have community, which is we gather. We need to have communication, which means that we talk and listen. Right? We have two ears and one mouth. We should be twice as prone to listen as much as we are to speak, right? But sometimes I find myself doing all the talking and not listening. So in order to communicate, we need to listen and talk. And, and then, of course, communion. So community, communication, and communion. What's communion? It's discerning the Lord's body. Not just the elements, but when we take the elements, we know that His body is full of Gentiles. People from all walks of life, all sizes, shapes, and colors, different ethnicities. This is the church, and the church is making the difference in the world today because it represents God's coming kingdom, not man's corrupt kingdom. Can I get a witness in this house? Amen. Why don't you stand with me? 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, it profits me nothing. It's sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. So the real language that God is speaking through his church is that language of love. And I think we can go out and change the world by being nice to people, loving to people, and, and just, you know, including them, drawing them in, letting them know that we care. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Lord, we're just reminded over and over again that we are undone and we are nothing without you. We can't govern ourselves. We can't rule ourselves. That's, that's just listening to Satan's lies. We're not good enough to do it, but you are, Father. And you sent your son 2,000 years ago, a baby born in a manger. And it was prophesied that the increase of his government and peace, that there would be no end. And so we're looking for that kingdom kind of governing that draws people in, that there is true spiritual unity, godly unity, unity even in diversity. We thank you for that. We celebrate that today and help us live that out this week. Help us to be your church. Thank you for bringing us in by gathering, but now send us off on mission. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen.